Passover is the spring festival that begins on the first full moon of the first month of the Hebrew calendar, Nisan. It commemorates the liberation of the children of Israel out of almost 400 years of bondage and slavery to the Egyptians. It's called Passover because the Lord passed over or protected his children while at the same time he was pouring out judgment on the world or the Egyptians. Much like the time that we have entered into now in these last days, God is pouring out his judgment. He is arranging the nations, putting hooks in their mouth. He's lining everything up. But at the same time, he is protecting his own people. He is marking them with the Tav. Exodus chapter 12 directed each family to sacrifice an unblemished male lamb of the first year on the evening of the 14th day of Nisan. And they were to apply the blood to the two side posts of the door and the lintel of the door of the house in which they spent that night. Verse 11, he says, And then you shall roast that lamb, and you shall eat it with your loins girt, with shoes on your feet, with a staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. In other words, at the conclusion of this Passover, I'm taking you someplace. I'm taking you out of where you've been. And I'm leading you into a season you've never walked in before. It is a time for great adjustments and great change in your life. Not only am I passing over you, I'm also passing you through some things to bring you into the next season of my walk with you and your walk in my glory and in my spirit. It's translated from the Hebrew word pasach, which the Jacinius lexicon defines as a sparing and immunity from penalty, judgment, and calamity. And that's what we're entering into. Verse 12, God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute my judgment. I am yad heh vav -Heh. Passover is not only a time for humans, it's also a time that God is executing judgment against the heavenly rulers of this earth system, the cosmocratoris, as Paul writes in the book of Ephesians. In fact, I had a prophetic dream about this last September of 2023, where I saw the great judgment cloud of God coming in the heavenly realm and dealing with all the heavenly beings that men worship as gods and follow. They are the gods of this world as he's bringing judgment upon them and getting everything lined up for the last days, God said, also prepare yourself for the change of nations. Because as he deals with the heavenly host, the fallen angels, and the rulers of the darkness of the world, it'll also cause great change in the earth and in the nations and in the cities and the lands. And that's what we've been going through for these last several years. In Exodus 12, 13, he continued, and the blood that you put on your door, the blood shall be to you for a token. The Hebrew word la oath, lamin aleph tab. It shall be a sign of the highest order, a mark and a beacon of what is to come. It is a mark. It is the aleph and the tav, the alpha and the omega, you'd say it in the Greek language. It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and everything in between. It is a divine, special mark and beacon of what is to come. And then he said this, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, here is a hidden secret and mystery that most people that read this verse in Exodus 12, 13, never actually go to the root, to the Meso Maserotic text or to the original text. So they don't see what it is I'm fixing to explain to you. When I see the blood is written this way. When I see, look at the next two letters, the eth. The Aleph and the Tav, it's not translated. And then the next word is Hadam, the blood. When I see the Aleph and the Tav in the blood, then I will pass over you. Who is the Aleph? What is the Aleph? What does the Aleph Tav represent? 
Well, when Jesus appeared to the, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos, as he was giving to him the revelation of the book of Revelation of the time of the end, he appeared and he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now, he's a full-blooded Hebrew He's speaking to a full-blooded Hebrew, John. He didn't use Greek words, although they use Greek in the translation of this particular book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. I believe he was speaking in Hebrew. He said, John, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last, the beginning and the ending, saith the yod heh vav heh Lord. Look at this. I am the one which is... That's present, which was, that's past tense, and I'm the one that is to come, the Almighty One. In other words, he said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. I am always there in your past, in your present, and in your future. And no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing in life, you can rest assured that I am there in your past, in your present, and your future. I am always there. The Aleph and the Tav, as you begin to look at this and notice this word throughout the original text in the, in the Old Testament of the Hebrew language, you begin to see where it shows up all over the place. It's just never translated. It represents the presence of God. It represents the essence of God. It represents, I believe, the Lord Jesus Christ. The very first verse of the Bible and the last chapters of the Bible, the Aleph and the Tav is there. Let me show it to you now. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens, it's plural, and the earth. And it's written this way. Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, created Elohim, God. And Elohim is plural. God is the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost created in the beginning. Well, what did they create? Let's go on reading. They created et hashamayim va'et ha'aretz. Notice the aleph and the tav mentioned twice here in this verse. It's not translated. Why they didn't translate it, I don't know. I don't think they understood what it, what it actually meant. It was some sort of mysterious thing. It's the first letter and it's the last letter and everything in between. It represents the elements, the substance. Uh, Adam Clark's commentary says it's the prima materia. It's the essence of what it is that he's creating. It's the atomic molecules. It's the molecular, molecular uh, structure. It's the substance, the beginning and the end. It's everything that needs to be for the heavens and the earth to exist for the full time of the space-time continuum that we're living in. It's the basic elements of the self of God is Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 in the Amplified says that Jesus is the Aleph and the Tav, and he is the sole expression of the glory of God. He is the light being, the outraying and the radiance of the divine. He is the perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature. And he's upholding and he's maintaining and he's guiding and he's propelling the entire universe by his mighty word of power, by his Aleph Tav. Did you hear that? Some of the rabbis from millennia ago wrote that first the Lord creator had to create the Hebrew language before he could speak into existence creation of the physical world of the planet in the universe. He had to create the Aleph and the Tav and every letter in between because it's a living language. They are living letters. First, he created the Aleph and the Tav and all the letters, and then he used the Aleph Tav to create the substance of the heavens and the earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Aleph Tav is also there at the end. In the last chapters of the book of Revelation, chapter 21, and, and Jesus sitting on the throne said, it is done, I am the Alpha and the Omega, well, again, he's a Hebrew. I believe he was saying, I am the Aleph and the Tav. I am the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He was there at the beginning. He was there at the end. If you study the word of God, the original text, whenever Abraham was offering up his son Isaac, establishing a covenant through which Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews, God would then raise Jesus from the dead. Because Abraham entered into covenant and offered his own son on an altar. Now God had the right to enter in because of the Abrahamic covenant and raise his son, Jesus, from the dead. Did you get that? 
Well, it says in Genesis 22, 4, that when Abraham and Isaac were walking through the hills around what is now modern day Jerusalem, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off that God was telling him to go and to build the altar to sacrifice his son. And it just so happened to be Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, which is now in modern day Jerusalem. But in the original text is written this way, and he saw the et, the aleph and the tav of the place. Now, I don't know if he saw the aleph and the tav suspended in air over the place, or if he just saw it in his spirit, the aleph and the tav over the place. But that was the thing that caused him to now say to his servants, you stay down here. Isaac and I are going up there and we're going to build an altar and we're going to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. And Isaac said, I, here's, the, here's the fire, here's the wood, where's the sacrifice? And Abram says, the Lord will provide. <laughs> Why? Why was he so sure? Why, where was his faith built on? On the Aleph and the Tav that he saw supernaturally or physically on that day, the third day when they were walking. The Aleph and the Tav was also present when the first temple, Solomon's temple, was built and then was dedicated. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 that when the singers and the worshipers were making one sound and in perfect harmony and they were singing unto God and saying, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever, verse 14, that the glory of the Lord filled that temple so that the priests could not keep standing on their feet. They couldn't continue their service of ministry because of the cloud that descended on the temple. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Now look at the original text. For hath filled the kavod, the glory of the yad heh vav -Heh. And look at the next, the next word, the next two letters. The Lord Aleph Tav. The Lord Yahweh and the Lord Jesus was there, and the house was filled with Ha Elohim, with the presence of Almighty God. Elohim, again, plural, with the Godhead, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit, the glory was there, the, the Yad Heh Vav Heh was there, and the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, Jesus Christ was there, filling that temple. <laughs> After the children of Israel were, were led out from that day of Passover. And on the third day, when God brought them into a certain place to deal with the final Egyptian God in the Exodus chapter 14. And all of a sudden, here comes Pharaoh's army ready to kill them. And now they've got the, the, the sea behind them and they're trapped. They got mountains on the, on the north, mountains on the south, the sea on the east and Pharaoh's army on the west. They were encircled. Maybe you're going through something right now where you feel trapped. You feel hemmed in. You feel like there's, there's no way out. Well, I'm here to tell you the Aleph and the Tob is with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you've been in bondage to, no matter what people have done to you and how bad your past has been, if you'll open your eyes, you'll see the Aleph Tob. You'll see Jesus working in your midst. And verse 13 says, And Moses lifted up his hands and said to the people, Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, <laughs> which he will show you today for the Egyptians whom you have seen today. You will see them again no more forever. Let's look at the original text and see Uru. Look at the next two letters and see the Aleph and the top and see the Alpha and the Omega and see the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, here he is, the Aleph and the top. And the next word is salvation of the Lord. But the word for salvation is the Hebrew word Yeshua, which also is the word, the Hebrew word for Jesus. See the Aleph and the top, which is Yeshua, yad He vav He. Glory to God. yad He vav He and Yeshua are one in the same. They're together and they're one. Jesus is always there. In your worst circumstance, in the most horrific time you're going through, when you feel abandoned or you feel like nothing's working out, you feel like you're just going to be a slave or addicted to this thing, you're going to be defeated and overcome for the rest of your life. If you'll take the time and stand still and open your eyes, 
Pray in the Holy Spirit and say, God, enlighten the eyes of my understanding. I promise you, you will see the presence of God in your midst because he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. The Aleph Tav is always there because you're his child and he's marked you and he's branded you. And whatever the enemy is doing in your life, he is going to bring you through it and you're going to come out the other side victorious because the Aleph and the Tav is always there. Listen to this verse in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 of the Amplified Classic Translation. The Apostle Paul wrote, For God himself has said in the Amplified, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. Look at this. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless or forsake you or let you down or relax my hold on you. And just in case you didn't get it, assuredly not. <laughs> you say, well, why did they say it this way? Because they are correctly translating the original manuscript. I believe it's the, if memory serves me right, it's the only place that I have found that a triple negative was used in one verse. In the original Greek translation, the negative ooh was repeated three different times in this verse. Hence, the Amplified saying, I will not, I will not, I will not. He was saying it over and over and over again, three times to make you get a hold of this, that he will never in any way fail you. He will never leave you without support. The Aleph Tav, the presence of the Alpha and the Omega is always there in your life. And even if you don't feel it, even if you don't feel all that hopeful or excited, he is still there. And all you got to do is just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost and say, God, open the eyes of my understanding and stand still and say, I am now going to see the Aleph and the Tav. God is going to make a way through this situation and bring me through because he is in my past. He's in my present and I can always expect him to be in my future. Hallelujah. In the next verse, Paul continues and said, because God has made this commitment to you to be there always in your life. So we can now take comfort and we can be encouraged and we can be confident and we can say boldly, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not let fear get a hold of me. I will not fear or I'll not be filled with dread. I will not be terrified. And then the Amplified says it this way, what can man do to me? <laughs> well, they can intimidate you. They can throw words at you. They can close doors. They can insult you. They can lie about you. They can turn people against you. But in the end, they will never drive the Aleph and the Tav away from you. The Alpha and the Omega, the Lord Jesus Christ will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he'll take you by the hand and he'll bring you through whatever you're going through. You can count on it. It's the Lord's Passover. While he's bringing judgment on the earth, he's passing over you. And he's telling you to put your shoes on and put the staff in your hand. Because I'm taking you places, buddy. I'm taking you places. You're going to step into things you've never walked in before. You're going to see things you You've never seen before, you're going to begin to do things you've never done before because it's the season of the Passover and the Aleph and the Tav is present. Hallelujah. You don't have to stay stuck where you are. You don't have to sit down and say the rest of my life, this is the way it's going to be. There is a way out. There is a door. The Aleph and the Tav has provided a door and that door is called the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 10, 7, for verily, verily, of a truth, of a truth, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And it's in the genitive, which means ownership. He said, my sheep have a door. Now, the world might not have access to the same door because they've made their decision. But you do. You have access because you belong to him. He's purchased you. He paid the price of his own life. He allowed himself to be to suffer on the cross and he shed his blood and he went into hell and was raised from the dead. He paid the ultimate price. He gave up his own life to purchase you. You belong to God. Whatever he purchases, he provides a door for you to enter into his presence and to let his presence enter into your life. And Jesus is that door. The Aleph and the Tom is that door. Verse 9, I am the door. And by me, the Hebrew preposition dia, through me, 
As you go through the door, as you step into the olive and the tav, you will enter in and you'll be sozo. You'll be saved, delivered, healed, made whole, made prosperous in every area of your life. And then you'll begin to go in and out of that door and you will find pasture. You will go through this portal called the Aleph and the Tav and you'll go into the spirit and you'll come back into the natural. You'll go into the heavenly realm and you'll come back into the physical realm. You'll begin to move with ease into all of these realms of the spirit and the natural realm and you'll move with ease in victory and in abundance because Jesus is the door. He is the gateway to the supernatural realm he is the door into the realm of God's glory. Hallelujah. Jesus is the door into all of the realms that God has prepared for you and I to walk in. And because it's Passover, you need to get ready. You need to put your shoes on. You need to get your belt tight. You need to put the staff in your hand because he's taking you places. He's bringing you into a place you've never walked in before. You're going to see things you've never seen before. And there's an anointing that you've never walked in before that's coming on you because this is the time of Passover. We've entered into the Passover of the last days. Hallelujah. And there is so much more that we have yet to experience. Listen, just like I'm sharing with you things that have always been there for like three, 3,500, 4,000 years, whenever the original Hebrew text was written, it's been there for many millennia. And so many people read the verses, they've never seen what I've just shared with you today about the Aleph and the Tav, the Eth being present. They've read the verse time and time again, They've heard it preached time and time again, but they didn't see what I just shared with you a few moments ago. Why? Because they stopped looking. They stopped going through the door. They stopped stretching themselves out. They begin to just get satisfied with their life. They are no longer pressing in and stretching themselves out. I'm here to tell you, this is the time to wake up, to get out of bed and to stretch yourself out like you never have before. Because there are things God is going to show you that you've never even imagined before. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 33 was being arrested over and over again for prophesying about the judgment that was coming. Coming judgment, Jerusalem destroyed, but in 70 years, God is going to bring the people back and rebuild the temple. And they didn't want to hear it, so they locked him up. So he's in the courtyard of the prison. He's chained to a post. They probably whipped him. They abused him. I don't know. This is, I think, the second or third time he'd been arrested. But in any case, he's got plenty enough a reason to be depressed and down if he's going to feel sorry for himself. So in the midst of him being arrested and ridiculed and laughed at, chained to a post, then the Lord appears to him and he says, call unto me and I will answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things which you know not of. <laughs> While you're in prison, when it looks like it's over, it's the worst that it could be. God says, there's still so much more. And I want to take you into realms you've never walked in before. I want to open doors and windows into things you've never seen before. You're going to hear things. I'm going to explain things to you that you have never even known were there. Answers you've been looking for. Keys you needed to unlock and to bind and to loose. The message translation says, call to me and I'll answer you and I'll tell you marvelous and wonderful things that you could have never figured out on your own. There is so much more for us to enter into. The day before, they had no idea what was going to happen. The children of Israel over 400 years, around 440 years of, of being in bondage, most of those years in slavery. They had no concept. They were getting ready to be the most prosperous their family had ever been. They had no idea they were going to begin to be just, just lauded with the gold and the silver and the wealth of the Egyptians. They had no idea that the cloud and the pillar of fire was going to be there. They had no idea about the supernatural provision of, of the manna and the quail and the water coming out of a rock. They had no idea, and neither do you and I really have much of an idea of what we've already begun to step into. And so we've got to adopt the mindset of the Passover mindset. We've got to get ready. We're about to step into things we've never walked in before. We're about to see things we've never seen before. We're about to walk in anointing to hear things we've never heard before. And we need to take advantage of the door that's before us, the door that's Jesus. 
Isaiah prophesied. He said, I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, Yehuda, Judah. Jesus came out of the tribe of Judah. Do you know how you spell Judah? Well, I want you first to look at the word that's translated capital L-O-R-D, yod He vav He. Look at it, yod He vav He. If you take yod He vav He and you scoot it over and you stick in the Dalith, the door, you've got Yehuda. <laughs> God put a door in his name and that's the tribe of Judah. And the one that's coming out of the tribe of the Judah, that is the door, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And if you will accept this door and, and pursue this door and learn how to walk in this door and appreciate this door, look at the next verse, then you'll walk through the valley of Achor, which literally means the valley of trouble. You'll go through trouble, noisome, pestilence, bad times trying to defeat you and pull you down. But that place of trouble is going to turn into a place of rest for you and for your herds, for my people that have sought me. Hallelujah. He said, if you will learn how to walk in that door that's there for you in the elephant top, you will find a resting place even in the time of trouble. <laughs> and who's going to, he, he, he clarifies it though. It's not for everybody. Now everybody's going to see this. Most people will just read over the verse and go on. Whatever Edcor is, I have no idea. But only a few, those that sought me, darash uni, those that seek, and the first letter of that word is dala, those that seek the door, those that walk through the door of inquiring and seeking after God. The message translation says it this way. The valley of Achor of trouble will become a place for your herds to rest and graze in. This will be for the people, listen to this, who bothered to reach out to me. The people who wanted me in their lives and who actually bothered to look for me. You see, it's not enough to just to know a verse, to be able to memorize it or quote it. You've got to dig into the depths of it. It's not enough just to know the principles of what it means to be born again or filled with the Spirit or your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's not enough just to know that. You've got to plumb the depths of the lines and the precepts and the concepts of the revelation that's beyond what we have been taught so far, beyond what we've heard so far. There's more. <laughs> the best is yet to come. And it all comes as we learn how to walk through the door. The door is the Aleph and the Tav, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me close with this verse in Colossians. The apostle Paul writes, if you then be risen in Christ, then you need to seek the things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. And you've got to set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. He's saying you need to get the Passover. You need to put the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel, but you need to do it with your shoes on, with a staff in your hand, because I'm fixing to take you out of where you're at into heavenly places. The mirror translation says it this way, but you have to see yourself co-raised with Christ and ponder with persuasion the consequence of what it means to be co-included in one with the olive and the tav. What does it mean to be one with Christ? You have to relocate yourselves mentally and begin to meditate on the word and ask God to show you things that you don't know, to open, enlighten the eyes of your understanding and to give, impart revelation knowledge to you, to engage your thoughts with throne room realities where we are co-seated in Christ, in the olive and the top, in the executive authority of God's own right hand. Ugh. Verse two, so that we can become affectionately acquainted with throne room realities that will cause us to stop being distracted by the earthly realm. There's so much more, but the earthly realm is distracting you. And you got to learn how to take your eyes off what's going on on the earth and put it in the heaven where Jesus is. The message translation says, so if you're serious, if you're really serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, you need to act like it and pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along with your eyes on the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Instead, look up and be alert to what's going on around you in Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his, 
his perspective. In other words, put your shoes on, put the staff in your hand, apply the blood to your life and look for the Aleph Tav. It's time. It's time for us to step in to the higher realms, the higher dimensions of these last days.